Thank you, Helen. And Ross, thank you so much. First Peter chapter 1. I'd like to um, talk about hope today. Uh, if we can put up the first thing. It's coming. Thanks, Ross. Ross had to slip away, just come and play and then slip away today. How you going there? That's quite okay. Let me read the um, 25 verses of the first chapter. Now, this morning I want to really do interactive stuff. So I'm going to ask you questions and get your responses. Is that a good idea? We'll make this a home group today. What are you frightened about? <laughs> so, in the English Standard Version, I've not got it up here. I want to uh, just, uh, if you can listen, if you've got your Bibles with you or if you've got them on your phone, uh, turn up to 1 Peter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, in some versions, it's abundant mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation... The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating that he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent, subsequent glories. Sometimes it gets you a little tongue, that one. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you. We could do a whole sermon on that bit. In the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, 
knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this, is the good, this word is the good news that was preached to you. What a chapter. We could spend hours and hours just picking it apart today. For there are little intricate pieces in that that are just awesome and wonderful and we could get into the depths of that. I could do a whole series on just one chapter or a few verses of the one chapter. I remember when I was in Bible college, our principal preached every chapel on Exodus 4. I think it was Exodus 4. Just a few verses exposing the whole lot in a whole semester. <laughs> that was interesting. So, today, how are you going there? I have to restart. We'll just, we, we're going to talk on hope, a sure expectation. So I'm going to ask you to be thinking about this. If you've got your Bibles, uh, you'll have the cheat notes. Um, so we'll look through this chapter about hope. But when we're waiting for that to come up, we look at our world today and there is so much uncertainty, isn't there? There it is. Thanks, Joanna. Ta-da! <laughs> uh, so a few more grey hairs popped out there. That's all right. There is so much uncertainty the cost of living in our world, inflation, how will we meet our mortgage repayments, is my job secure, will I have enough to live on in retirement, what new tax laws are the government going to introduce, my rent keeps going up, I can't get anywhere to live. Will we destroy our world through greenhouse gas emissions? For many, as I hear people speak to me, it's like all their hope is lost, or it's getting to be that, that way. As I hear people being interviewed on uh, news programs and how things are falling to bits for them, it seems for them all hope is lost. Some time ago, I was speaking to a specialist oncologist, a cancer doctor, uh, who is setting up a charity. Now, this man is not a believer in God. He's not against, but he's just not uh, committed to that. He's setting up a charity in which he'll be working with people who have life-threatening illness. And he said to me that longevity in their illness journey is directly linked to them having hope or hopelessness. He said that people who, who have hope will strive more, will look forward, will actually, more than those who are in hopelessness, have a better chance of living longer. So he wants to work alongside of people who are in life-threatening illness to help them to have some sort of hope. Now, that's in a physical sense, isn't it? But what about in a spiritual sense? 
Paul in this chapter writes to a collection of Christian communities that are going through some significant spiritual challenges. If you see here in the the version I read, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. In the Living Bible, it says, from Peter, Jesus Christ's missionary, to the Jewish Christians driven out of Jerusalem and scattered throughout Pontus, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia Minor, and Bithynia. So he was saying, you are exiles. Imagine for those people in Palestine at the moment, not talking about Hamas, the regime, I'm talking about the individual civilian people who have been driven from their homes to the south of um, Gaza to escape the onslaught of the uh, IDF, the Israeli Defence Forces. Imagine what it would be like for Ukrainians who have, in the war, have uh, shifted on the, to the opposite side of the world, over to, to Australia, as Australia took on the refugees out of, out of Ukraine. Imagine what it's like for the African people who are trying to get over to Europe in their boats to, a, to just get a better life and to escape the regimes that they live in. Exiles. These people were exiles. They were thrown out of, driven out of Jerusalem, their homeland, out of their very homes. And they were the dispersion, it's called, or they were scattered. Being scattered away from that which you know and the people you know is awful. I've been watching a few documentaries on uh, Nazi, the Nazi regime and how people from various nations were forced out of their lands and put into concentration camps. And even as they got to a place like Auschwitz and they were with their mum and dad or brothers and sisters and they were all split up and they never saw them again, scattered. And they know that they were killed. Scattered. That's what these people were facing. And so Peter is writing a letter to them. They were cast away from the places they belonged to, the one places they knew so well, the places where they'd go shopping, the places where they'd get water, the places where they were familiar And now they're in different places, and mostly in this letter, they're in the region of what we call, uh, what we now know as modern Turkey. Physically, they're under the reign of the Roman Empire. Without much hope of belonging, unsure of the future, not sure of much at all. But Peter reminds them that they have a hope. Not in the physical circumstances, not in the reign of the Roman Empire, as much as we have eternal hope in the reign of the Australian government, not. No matter what brand is in, no matter what set of rascals are uh, elected into office, there's not much hope, really. And I don't know about you, but they all say, we're getting, we're improving, we're improving. No, we're not. Get over yourself. We're not improving. Things aren't better in the good old days. No such thing as them. (laughs) No such thing. It's where we live right now. But I'm digressing. So, Peter reminds them that they have a hope not in the physical circumstances of the reign of Rome, but they have a hope in Christ. It reminded me of uh, the psalmist when he said, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, 
my salvation. The psalmist writes confidently about hope in God. <laughs> but as we read this, the psalms wider, this comes with a battle to maintain it, doesn't it? Because the psalmists weren't always in that hope in God stuff. They were always, help, as well. We use the word hope in at least three different ways. Hope is a desire for something good in the future. The children in, at home say, I hope Daddy gets home early tonight so we can play uh, games outside before dinner. Hope is a good thing in the future that we are desiring. We say, I hope Jim will arrive safely. In other words, Jim's safe arrival is the object of our hope. Do you get it? Hope is the reason why our hope might indeed come to pass. We say, a good tailwind, if you're flying home, good tailwind is our only hope of arriving on time. In other words, the tailwind is the reason we may in fact achieve the future good that we desire. It's our only hope. So hope is used in these three senses in our language, in the way we talk, in the way we express it. And ordinarily, the way we express hope we are expressing uncertainty. But this is not the distinctive biblical meaning of hope. Biblical hope is not just a desire for something good in the future, but rather, although it, it does, the Bible does talk about that and really alludes to that, biblical hope is a confident expectation and desire for something good in the future. Biblical hope not only desires something good for the future, it expects it to happen. It's that sure, confident expectation that what God says will happen. That his word is true, his word is sure, and that truth will never ever fade away, as we read in that scripture today. The word of the Lord remains forever. And not only does it expect it to happen, but it's confident that it will happen. There is a moral certainty that the good we expect and desire will be done. So, when we walk the days of uncertainty... When we walk those, that journey where we can't see tomorrow and none of us can see tomorrow, we know that God has us in the palm of his hand and that he has our future already secure. How do we know that? Because we read it in this scripture. Peter is writing to these communities who are seeking to follow Jesus more and addresses what would be the sometimes sense of questioning? Whether they have hope in their situation. In that way, he speaks to us as well, doesn't he? I would like to examine how Peter describes hope. Now, if you've got your Bibles, you're the ones who have to give some answers today. Because you can read it. The others uh, can't read it because I haven't got it up on the screen. But I can, let's have a, just a few of the first few verses. Blessed, I'll read it from the Living Bible. Oops. Dear friends, God the Father chose you long ago and knew you would become his children. And the Holy Spirit has been at work in your hearts, cleansing you with the blood of Jesus Christ and enabling you to please him. May God bless you richly and grant you increasing freedom from all anxiety, fear and fear. 
All honour to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for it is his boundless mercy that has given us the privilege of being born again. So out of that, hope is for who? When we talk about the biblical hope, who is it for? Sorry? Us? And who are us? He's those... Sorry? Hope in this context, this hope, is for all believers. Those who have been born again, begotten as children of God, or made to be children of God. How do I know that God knew that I would become a believer? That I was, as in some versions would say that we were elect. How would I know that? Choose to believe. Then you'll know. Not only is hope for all believers, but if you read it, according to his great mercy. So what's hope through? Yeah. Through God's kindness and mercy. The new birth, being born again. We were dead in our trespasses, slaves to our sin. He gave us faith with which to believe, not a result of our good works, but it is his grace that he gave us that faith, that gift of God. Yeah, Dale. He actually, uh, I can't believe it. When God, I can't believe it when you get baptised. We come to believe when you put that belief in Jesus. Baptism is an open show or an outward show of what Jesus has already done on the inside. It's an outward show of inside work. So he does that inside work, causing us to be born again, made new, made alive in his righteousness, in his right living. So then it says he's caused us to be born again to a what? A living hope, Marie. So hope is living. How is it living? What's that, Marion? Yeah, it's living, and the, the only way it can be enacted living in us is because we have a living saviour. He was resurrected. He is living. So he is our hope, isn't he? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay. So it goes on from there. Have a look on your Bibles. And it says, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance. What's our inheritance? Eternity, yeah. To be with him. New creations. Behold, he has made us new creations and we look forward to being those new creations in the new heavens and the new earth but we're new creations now. So the inheritance begins now. Now, what does it say about that inheritance? Anybody want to show, say what it is? I've written it up here. It's this. It's incorrupted. The inheritance can't be corrupted. The inheritance can't be, un, is, can't be defiled by anything. And it's secure. It's secure. How do we know it's secure? It's unfading. Because it says, kept in heaven for you. Heaven, not necessarily a realm, but in the reign of God. Kept for you, if you're reading your scriptures, who, who's who, you, you've got to read the, the way that it's written, kept in heaven for you, who, I love this bit, who by God's power are being guarded through faith. Do you get this? 
God is guarding you by God's power. What power are we talking about? This is the power of creating the heavens and the earth sort of power, isn't it? This is the power of splitting the Red Sea so that the Israelites could go through. This is the power that rose Jesus from the dead. This is this power that's keeping you. Yes. He said it. Everything, and that's another sermon talking about logos and word and everything. He said it. That's it. Do you ever remember that little bumper sticker God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, I think that's in the wrong order. No. God said it, that settles it. Then I believe it. It's not settled because I believe. It's settled because he did. Okay. Okay, come on, this is a home group. Don't go to sleep just yet. Um, So hope is incorruptible, undefiled, secure. Hope is refined, strengthened, and proved through hardship. Uh oh. Bonk bong. <laughs> bon. yeah, let's skip over that one. <laughs> if you look in your Bible, um, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while. We rejoice in what? the inheritance that's being kept, the fact that God is keeping us by his power, ready for the last day, in that we can have that sure expectation that we are with God forever, that sure expectation that he is holding everything for us and he's holding us. And he says, but you're going to have a tough time. Great. It's strengthened. It's like if you go to the the gym. God forbid. Um, Do I look like I go to the gym? Um, You go to the gym and you might press weights, lift weights, do things. Why? What's it for? Keep fit. And what else? Uh, In whose terms? (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's a matter of perception. <laughs> Sorry? Strengthen you. Yeah, so build muscle. Where well, you have more energy. Yeah, you can have more energy. But building muscle comes from resistance, doesn't it? You must resist some weight or something so that the muscle increases. And you know why it hurts after you've done a workout? because it tears all the little fibres so that it can grow bigger. That's why. So you need resistance to grow your physical muscle. You need resistance to grow hope and faith. Because in that we grow in confidence of who God is. If you see a church, I know not a church, but even a person who say, this is so wonderful, it's, everything's going so smoothly, thinking, what's wrong with you? That's not natural. We go through wonderful times and things that go smoothly, but we go through times that are hard. We need to walk through the hard times to refine us, as that Bible passage, to, to refine us like what? Gold. Had anybody know how you refine gold? Fire, heat. How does it work? You heat it up, heat it up, heat it up, heat it up, the metal man. Yeah, it takes all of the dross, not the rubbish, in the metal and it floats it to the top and they scoop off the rubbish. Yes. Well, if you think about the context of the fear that is used in this scripture, it talks about that reverential fear, that acknowledgement, reverence of God and who he is. 
And so it grows us to know who's the boss. It grows us to know who's in charge and take the dependence of ourselves and put it onto him. That's why the scriptures say that the cross of Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing because we've got to take their dependence off us and put it on him. And that it's in that context of reverential fear that hope becomes in Christ, hope becomes in him, not in ourselves, our circumstances, or our abilities or our skills. Our hope is in him. In our prayer meeting this morning, um, Elspeth was praying about the Sabbath rest for the people of God. It comes out of Hebrew 4. The rest that we have is Christ. We can't manufacture it. It's him who gives it. So in our, it's in his great mercy that we are born again. It's because of him that we have faith. It is a gift of God. I, I struggle with this Christian life in a sense, that it's hard to understand. I was a slave to sin. I couldn't help but sin and I didn't want God at all. But he revealed himself to me and he gave me the gift of faith, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he gave me the gift of faith with which to believe. Then he gives me the ability and the strength to repent and then he gives me the ability to serve him and then when I depart this life and go into his presence he gives me a reward for all that he's already given me and I don't get it because I've got to earn it to satisfy and justify myself but he's saying no no I'm the one who does it so We'll just get through this. So therefore, what does hope result in? If, you, if someone would look after the various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more than precious gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in something. Praise and glory and honour. So all of our attention goes to the one who's given it. That's what this hope is about. And then finally, hope is certain. Because we know that although we have not seen him, we love him. And that the outcome of our faith is the salvation of our souls. It's certain. We know that and, or, and then r- the hope is the reason for inexpressible joy. Is this good or what? I wish there was sitting down there listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> so in Colossians 1.27, it says... Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ is the hope of what is to come. Christ is the hope of all that is that he is doing and transforming. Because, and I have said this to you before, my Bible college principal used to say, this is my favourite quote of his, um, God is far more interested in what he can do in you than what you can ever do for him. Do you know that Helen Shackey is going to arrive in the presence of God one day? And my take on it is like this. Jesus will see you coming. Come through the gates, walk up the path, here you are. It's not like that. But Helen arrives and Jesus is not going to say, as far as I can tell, Hey, Dad, look. You know who's here? It's Helen Shackey. Do you know what she did in her life? She worshipped at the Peace Christian Community. She did this. She was a nurse. She did this and this and this. No. I reckon it's like this. Jesus will say, hey, Dad, look, a transformed heart. Here comes our glory. 
because it's out of the transformed heart that comes the glory of God. It's that hope because he has made it new. Do you get it? So no matter what we face, we can have a hope that is certain and true, a hope that is eternal. And so finally, what comes in us as we are filled with this hope? What would come? We read it before. What's the outcome of your faith? The salvation of your souls. So, out of this hope comes the knowing. Do you know that you know that you know? What else comes? Well, we go on a little bit. If we were to go into verse 13, therefore preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, and that's another sermon, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So, it's saying, be sober-minded, be looking forward. Looking forward. Yes, we look back because the past shapes and moulds who we are. But we look forward to that which is to come. With hope. With a sure expectation. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. And not only that, set your hope fully on grace. What's grace? So I can't hear. A free gift. Unmerited favour of God upon us. We didn't do anything to deserve it. But he, it's out of his abundance, out of who he is, that he pours out his grace to us. See, it's not about us. It's about him who's done it. Isn't that, isn't that the crux of the problem? Because naturally, we want it to be about us. Naturally, we want to have achieved. We want to have some recognition that our how many years would this will and all of this is continually saying it's not about you, it's about God. It's about Did you hear that? That was really good. The disintegration of hope in self to enable us to have hope in him, in his grace and who he is. Yes, Cole? And that's why we constantly need reminding. Because we go through times in life that we need a reminder. I know in this, it's easy to do this next one. Do not slip back into your old ways. Do you know when we go through a tough time, it's easy to slip back to something that feels secure, that's something that feels familiar a sinful act or a sinful mindset or whatever it is that takes our attention away from the one who has saved us, that's the easy thing to do. And, Paul, and Peter's reminding us, I'm just reminding you guys, don't, don't go back. Do you remember Israel? And they're in Egypt. And then they got delivered from Egypt through the Red Sea into the wilderness. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, now we're in the wilderness. And then they start whinging. Oh, it was much better back there in Egypt. That's right. Yep. There's one difference between me and a computer. The, this is the main one. This is the main one. I, with one of us, you have to punch the information in more than once. And it's not the computer. Sorry, Matt, what were you going to say? Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no, that's quite okay. Are you coming back again? Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> so don't slip back into your old ways. And then it says, God is holy. God is set apart. And it's saying, be holy for I am holy. That comes out of Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. Be holy for I'm holy. What does that mean? I can't be God. No. Be holy for I'm holy. Let your life reflect the character of the Holy One. Let your life be a reflection. Out of you isn't the source of light, but you reflect the light. The moon isn't a source of light, but it reflects the light of the sun. Do you get it? When we used to go um, road trips at night time, and you see the little reflectors in the middle of the road, you know those little reflectors? We, Dad used to call them Henrys, and we all looked to see if we can see another Henry. Did that, that, remember that? Now, Henry isn't, has, doesn't have any light emitting from him or it, the reflection of the headlights of the car come back to say, stay in the middle of the road. Or the poles on the, the guideposts stay away from the side of the road. Yep, nearly finished guys. So let your life reflect the character of the Holy One. Didn't you love this? And we talk about the fear. Act in reverent fear of God. If you take time and think about Mary coming to the tomb and the other Mary, the two Marys, and here's the radiant glory of an angel that was like lightning and the guards fell down as if they were dead. That's scary. And that's just an angel, just a messenger. Imagine what it would be like in the radiant glory of God. Man, that'll make you tremble. Really? Act in reverent fear of God. And finally, what comes to us, it comes in us as we are filled with his hope. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Community comes from hope. Community amongst God's people. Even if you have to deal with brother or sister sandpaper. <laughs> You've encountered brother or sister sandpaper, haven't you? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> They're the grace growers in our lives. And we might be their grace grower. And it's not just about them, it's about we can be brother and sister sandpaper too. Now don't point the finger because when you point the finger there's three fingers pointing back at you, remember? So hope is the, uh, is the sure and certain expectation that what God says in his word is true and will happen and is already fulfilled in a in a forward sense. We see that finally when it says concerning this salvation 
the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. What the, the Old Testament prophets were prophesying about Christ, but they didn't know what he was looking like. Looking like. They didn't articulate what that was. They were speaking the, the prophecies of God concerning that he, he who is to come. So when a Moses or a prophet comes before Christ, before God, after he dies, what's the basis of his salvation? Is it his good works? What's the basis of an Old Testament saint's salvation? Christ. What's the basis of our salvation? Christ. The only difference is they look forward to Christ, we look back. So, as we finish here today, this has been revealed to us and the angels long to look into it. Why? Why do the angels long to look into the salvation and the hope and, and all that God has done in our lives? Do you understand? Because they, whilst created beings and we are created beings, they don't have any sin. It's talking about the holy angels. They, aren't with, they have no sin, so they don't know what salvation is like. They haven't been in sin to be saved from, so they don't know what this salvation is. So they long to look into this glory and this grace that has appeared, that has worked in our lives. Isn't that awesome? So hope is the sure and certain expectation of what God says will happen, has happened, is happening. So whatever you go through, know where your hope is lies father in the name of jesus we come before you with our uncertainties our imperfections our questions our doubts but we come to you because you are our source of hope and we choose to renew our hope and our trust in you today because of your word what Peter tells us, that by your mercy, you have caused us to be born again, to have a living hope that lasts forever, and that by your power, you are keeping us. We rest in you today, dear God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So. Uh